So, okay, here we go. We're jumping back into chapter 12, and we're going to pick up where we basically left off. Um, um, we uh, got all the way to almost near, almost to the end, uh, and, I'll, and I'll actually read that again because I think it's a good place to launch from. In John chapter 12, verse 27, he says, um, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. You know, the the whole concept of this hour, you know, and as we talked about last time, from the very beginning at the the wedding in Cana where where, um, Jesus told his mother, it's not yet my hour. And he was very aware of of, uh, his schedule, so to speak, his plan, the, the plan of God of, what would happen and when, and at a certain time he would turn himself in to be crucified. And now that hour is coming. He foresees it. Uh, I, I appreciate it. He says, now my soul is troubled. You know, one of the interesting things about Jesus is he's very open about his feelings. He shares them a lot. He tells them when he's overwhelmed. He tells them when he's sad. He tells them when he's troubled. He tells them he's, he's, you know, it's kind of funny, you know, as a man, he's incredibly in touch with his emotions and he's very open about it, um, which is remarkable. You know, typically, in, 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 you know, there's there's always, you know, the world and, and, and uh, you know, critics are always trying to point out, oh, this is follows patterns of classic hero literature and made up figures and stuff. Made up figures don't do this. Made up heroes don't do this. You don't read about Zeus sitting around saying he's feeling really troubled or, or, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not, it is not typical hero literature. This is a real person sharing what they're really feeling. And, and again, it's, it's part of God communicating Jesus and why John wrote this gospel. So we'd really know Jesus. So here Jesus is pouring his heart out and says, my soul is troubled. And he said, what do I say? Father, save me for this hour. No, it's for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus was very aware that he is fulfilling God's plan. He's doing as he's supposed to do. He's not going to try to get out of this hour. And and the last sentence is really kind of what sums up Jesus' life. Father, glorify your name. Everything he did was to glorify God. And I think, you know, there's an incredible freedom in that, that as we as disciples of Jesus, we learn to just hand over ourselves to God, to 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 just entrust, let go of of our plans and schemes and all that kind of stuff. Not that we shouldn't have them; we should definitely have them. But that we trust and trust ourselves to God. And remember, every time you say you read, believe, you have to also remember that it means to entrust. It means to put your faith in, to rely on, to 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 lean on, to depend on. Because Jesus talked about it a lot, and I think we cheapen the word believe by just thinking it's an intellectual assent when it's really much more entrusting and relying on. And this is what Jesus did, and he trusted God's plan, and that's what we should do. You know, some people see, and I've used this illustration again, I'll bring it up again, is as Christianity is kind of climbing this cliff where you're hanging on, you're hanging on, hoping not to fall off. Quite the opposite. Christianity is letting go and letting God, you know, and believing God and and trusting yourself in him. And that's what Jesus' attitude is as he goes into this next part of the gospel that becomes really intense. Here's a beautiful part. And it says in um, in verse 28, Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken. So God interjects, and he does not do this very often in the entire history of the world. He rarely does this, but he does it now. He interjects, and he says, I have glorified it, his name, and will glorify it again. And, you know, I mean, clearly he is he's encouraging Jesus. You're on track. We're on track. We're doing what the plan is. And Jesus said, the voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw my all people 
to myself. You know, and he he um he talks about how this is all following the plan, and you know, even the voice from heaven was was to build up their faith, not obviously not to build up his faith. He's got plenty of faith. It's it's for them and their faith to know that God is behind this. And which, you know, God does all the time. He 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 gives us little hints, he gives us little bite-sized morsels to build our faith on. We'll see things. Oh wow, how did that happen? Or wow, that was incredible. And and we all see this as disciples. That, you know, you I, I've heard I just heard somebody the other day talking about how they were praying, they were praying that God would show them a way. And then they met somebody who invited them to church. You know, I mean, how many times have we heard that? Dozens of times if you've been a Christian, where somebody is praying for something and then bam, somebody meets somebody from church. Or somebody helps somebody. And there's little things like that where, where I believe God just gives us kind of like, you know, like a, like a like a, a rock climber. They have those little rubber things. You go to the gym and you can climb up the oh, up the wall. Um, they're kind of like that. Something to grab a hold of and help us build our faith. Help us grow stronger in our faith. And so God always does that a lot. But now here's where, where it really gets uh, significant. What he's saying, he says... Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of the world will be driven out. And he says, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. There's, there's, this is actually theologically loaded here um, where, where uh, you know, he says, it's, it's the time for judgment. The world's going to be judged and Satan's going to be driven out. And these are two huge things that he just mentions. You know, and um, and one of the things that it really deserves a full on study, but but I I can at least tell you what he's referring, uh, what the reference is, is if if you've ever studied out Hesed in in particularly in the in the Old Testament, because Hesed is a Hebrew word, so it doesn't show up in the New Testament. Although Agape is the replacement word. However, unfortunately, we oftentimes study agape and we and we you know we get to the unconditional love. But the truth is hesed has a much deeper meaning. It's the same concept. You could say agape is one level of understanding, hesed is a much deeper level of understanding of how love works and how our love between God and us works. Um, this is the love that is between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the love, the community that we're invited to. And it's a community, it's a relationship, it is a covenant. Uh, it, it, God's love is covenantal, meaning that it, it, does, it does have expectations to fulfill. Now, it is still unconditional. I mean, God loves, period. Boom. That's because God is love, right? But if you really understand God's love and you study out Hesed, and it's hard to talk about it without going way into a deep study. Some sometime I'm going to make a video of just that, just God's love, Hesed, right? Um, but the bottom line is it's a covenant. So so you you either sign the contract or you reject the contract. And when Jesus died on a cross, he basically put a down payment on you. And it's for you to respond. If you don't respond, you are rejecting it. If you do respond, you are entering into hesed. You're entering into a covenant with God. So it is very important that we respond and not responding is a response. So that's why the world becomes judged by Jesus dying on the cross. It it, it becomes condemned in the sense that if it does not accept his payment on them, If you don't turn yourself into him, you are rejecting him. And if you are rejecting him, then woe to you on judgment day. So that's how it all works. I mean, that's an incredibly brief way of describing an incredibly deep concept. But maybe it sparks enough interest for you to go off and do a study on chesed. Um, In in a lot of Christian literature, it's it's spelled H-E-S-E-D. In Jewish literature, it's always spelled, it's pretty much always spelled C H E S E D. Um, so I would look them both up, Google them both if you want to study. Um, there's some great studies out there. I wrote a paper on it, um, but it's not conclude. It's not. Um, it's not that big of a paper, but 
but uh, I have some other studies um, that we could send. But anyways, uh, I'm getting distracted into Hesed. So then he says another thing that's incredibly important. In verse 32, it says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. This idea of being lifted up, in the Greek, it's hupso, it's it's held up, but it also can be translated exalted. In, in fact, the word has multiple meanings all around the same idea, to lift up, to hold up, to raise up, to, to push up, to exalt, to proclaim, okay? So that word becomes incredibly important because basically... Uh, Jesus was hoopsoed on the third day. He was raised from the dead. Uh, then he comes back and he preaches to everybody. And we read about this in Acts chapter 1. And then he's carried up into heaven, right? And then and the, the apostles, the disciples, they go all over Jerusalem. And what are they doing? They are holding up or exalting or li- uh, proclaiming the name of Jesus. And that is what they're to do. They go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the world, holding up, hoop sewing. I'm going to anglicize the word, hoop sewing Jesus. So in a sense, we all do that from the very first time, which is literally physically, he's nailed to a cross and lifted up to being carried up into heaven, to being proclaimed to the world. So this is... This is the first of it. It says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. It is also a key to ministry. It's also really important about our ministry is that, you know, we we worry a lot, and, and there's a lot of talk right now about why isn't the church growing? Why isn't Christianity spreading? On a, on a macro scale, you know, theologians, missiologists, church builders, church planners are all in this huge global discussion of why is the church not growing in the Western world? Why has it stopped growing? Down to our own fellowship, our own churches. Just last week, we had a meeting where there was a discussion about, about why isn't the LA church growing like it should be growing? You know, and, and, and everybody's discussing this. Here's a key. Jesus says that when I am lifted up, who? Jesus, not the church, not worship, not our methodology, not our tactics, not our outreach program, When he is lifted up, he says, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Jesus is the one who draws people. And it's to him. It's to him. So the question is, are we really proclaiming Jesus? Are we holding him up? And that happens on multiple levels from how I live Am I exalting Jesus by how I live, that that I'm different, that I apologize when I mess up, that I forgive freely, that I love others, that I love the unlovable, that I um, serve, that I give, that that's uh, how I live exalts Jesus, right? But on a bigger scale, is that what my focus is? Is that what the church's focus is? If you looked at the last 100 sermons, how many of them are about Jesus? How many of them focus on Jesus? How strongly is our focus on Jesus? Because Jesus is the key. He's the magnet, not us. Not us. Us in as much as we are an instrument of Jesus. Us in as much as Jesus is able to be formed in us and proclaim to the world, but it is Jesus. So I'm not saying that's the answer to all things here, but I am saying that it is a key that I think too often we we just miss. We're looking for tactics. And and are those tactics important? Yes, of course they are. You know, all missiologists, church planners, church builders know you got to have great worship right now. In this day and age, people judge you by your worship. They also know you got to have great online presence. You got to have a great website, great on online outreach. And if you don't, you're not going to be one of the fastest growing churches impacting. We also know that people judge churches by what they do for their community. And you better be out there serving the poor and doing something because if you're not, people are going to write you off because people are aware of that now. They're aware of the fact that Jesus did this and therefore so should Christians. So those are some of the tactics and they're good. 
They're right. We should be doing them. But they're not the key issue. The key issue is are we hoop sewing? Are we lifting up Jesus? Because basically he's going to draw everybody. That's why I became a Christian. I mean, I the guy who reached out to me showed me Jesus by his love, by his outreach. Many of you know him, Jeff Chacon. He showed me Jesus. But make no mistake, I didn't join the church because of him. I joined the church because of Jesus, right? And I bet that's the case for you, is that what really ultimately drew you was Jesus. And that's what we got to make sure that we are holding up, that we are drawn to. It's not about being the biggest church, the fastest church, the coolest church, the whatever church. It's about Jesus. And it's all about Jesus. So a lot packed into one little discourse here. I mean, a tiny few sentences, but there was a lot in there. And I'm warning you right now that the chapters 13, 14, 15 are just loaded. So we're going to take our time. We're actually going to take a little break at the end of the week and do a few uh, special videos and then go right back to John. But uh, let's go ahead and keep going here. Um, The time we got left. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Okay, and remember that this is a a, uh, kind of a hot term in that some people would not know anything about it, and then some people would have an idea about this. Then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness takes you. Whoever walks in the light, walks in the dark, does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of the light. And when Jesus had finished speaking, Jesus had left and hid himself from them. And remember, this was one of those, as we talked about at the very beginning in the background of John, one of those central themes of light and darkness, that being walking in the knowledge of God, walking with Jesus, being open and honest, this is in the light in that that. You only understand Jesus if you're walking in the light and that that is key. And he's telling them, look, don't stand around and and wait, jump on in, jump into the light, get out of darkness. Um, This is a continual discussion. And it says in verse 37, even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah, the prophet. So, you know, I mean, the fact is that 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 much of the world is just stubbornly ignorant. Uh, it always kind of makes me chuckle when people say, oh, I'm agnostic. And they don't realize what they're saying. Uh, gnosis is knowledge, the Greek word gnosis, and putting an A at the front means no or none or not, right? So you're basically, they're saying, I'm not knowledgeable or I'm ignorant is a, is a way we would say it in English. Um, and they think that means I haven't decided what it really means is I'm ignorant and I don't know what I'm, I don't know anything about this. I don't know what about what I'm talking about. Um, people are stubborn about that. They can still know enough and still choose to be ignorant, choose to be out of it, so to speak, not make a decision. It's just easier not to make a decision, especially in regard to Jesus. And you have to remember what he's, what he just said a few minutes ago about, about, the world being condemned that when he's lifted up, when Jesus is crucified, it was kind of the beginning of the end because it's, uh, it's kind of like if somebody bought you this incredible gift and gave it to you, you would of course be obligated to do something for them. Even if it's as little as writing a thank you card, that, that obligation, you know, uh, the, the old English we'd say much obliged. That's just recognizing that I'm obligated, right? Or in, when you say thank you in French, you say merci, right? That's that's grace. That's that's mercy. Have mercy because you've done for me, and I need to do back for you. Or or in Spanish we say gracias. That's grace because grace would dictate that that you know. Paul talks about my grace is. Uh, not without effect. His grace is not without effect. Somebody does something for you, you immediately feel like you should do something back for them. We are in a contract. That's what Hesed is, right? So again, he's bringing it back to that, that, that 
some people, no matter what God has done for them, they're not going to respond. And that will condemn them. Some people will be stubbornly ignorant. Some people will be stubbornly agnostic. They don't want to make a decision. They don't want to respond. And that is a very serious thing. The right thing is to become knowledgeable of Jesus, know Jesus, and respond to him. And it, and it is, again, all about Jesus, not about the church. Now, he, he starts quoting Isaiah because Isaiah talked a lot about this. Jesus quotes it, you know, Matthew reveals a lot of times when Jesus quoted. Here it's quoted again. He's quoted, but different scriptures even. This time he quotes um, different scriptures. He says, Lord, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been re- revealed? This, Isaiah 53 has a lot of this. For this reason they could not believe because as Isaiah says elsewhere, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so they could neither see with their ears of their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, nor turn, and I would heal them. These are people who just don't want to believe. Who just and he says, Okay, he's just blinded them. They're not gonna see it. That I realized this, and this may sound really stupid, but it's just the truth. You people will believe what they want to believe. And they will not believe what they don't want to believe. I said, well, duh, Robert, that's that's fairly obvious. In other words, and, and, and if you've been around a while, you understand what I'm talking about. You can sit there and can show somebody everything about baptism. But if they don't want to believe in baptism, they're not going to. They're just not going to. Because their decision is based more on emotion than it is on facts. And if somebody wants to believe in God, so to speak, or let's say, let's say, if somebody wants to believe in Jesus, they will. The evidence is sufficient, more than sufficient. But on the other hand, if somebody doesn't want to believe, there's always something they can grab onto. And they're not going to change their mind unless they want to. When we sit down to teach somebody who wants to believe, you're, you're feeding them like a hungry person. When somebody doesn't want to believe, it's argumentative and you're going nowhere. Our decisions are a lot of times much more emotionally based than we think. And that's what he's saying here, basically. Verse 42. Um, Well, I want to wrap this up. Let's go ahead and uh, 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 jump to 44. Then Jesus cried out, whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in the dark, in darkness. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them the last day. For I did not speak of my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life, so whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. Okay, we're finally up to chapter 13. I've got to say something about this, though, is, um, you know, it really is incredibly important that we we know Jesus' words, that we know what he says, because, one, they are the words that God gave him to say to us. This is vital information. I've shared before in the past, God doesn't tell me everything. There's a lot of things I'd like to know that God doesn't tell me. What I realized many years ago is I'm on a need-to-know basis. God tells me what I need to know. That he tells me. What I don't need to know, he doesn't tell me, even though my curiosity is bigger than that. But sometimes I've got to just trust in the Lord. I've got to just have faith. I've got to just know that God is good. And it's okay, I don't have all the information that I would like. But I have all the information that I need. Jesus tells us everything we need to know. But are we listening? That's the key. Is are we really listening? And I, I'm not talking to people who live in a village in India have never heard of Jesus. I'm talking about people who've grown up all around Jesus is information about Jesus. But how are we really listening? How much, how many of Jesus' words could we sit down right now and just write out? 
because we've memorized his words? How much of his teachings do we really know? Like we could recreate it. There's a movie called The Book of Eli that came out a few years ago about a man who memorized the entire Bible, right? Because all the copies had been destroyed. And so what he had in his head was incredibly important. How much of the Gospels could we recreate that we know it that well? And I'm not saying just sitting around memorizing, but even just knowing, like knowing what Jesus said. Could you could you repeat the Beatitudes? Can you repeat the Sermon on the Mount? Can we repeat the seven woes of Matthew 23? Could How much of it could we, we recreate? How many scriptures do we know? I went to a bar mitzvah and a young boy turning 13, bar mitzvah, stood up there and recited all 613 laws, Levitical laws, in Hebrew. <laughs> he recited them all. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh my goodness. And we struggle with one memory scripture a week. You know, I think, I think, I think it's incredibly important that we know Jesus' words. And, and he says, he says, he didn't come to judge the world. He came to save it. But the very words he spoke will stand in judgment. We will be judged by his words. So it's it's kind of like if somebody if you went took a class think of a class that's incredibly hard to take let's say took physics right most of us would tremble at the knees walking into a physics class and there's a few of you out there that would love it but most of us would be terrified. Imagine if on the first day of class the professor said Ever, I'm going to tell you today everything that will be on the final exam. Hallelujah. Wouldn't that be great? We'd write it all down and we'd know exactly what's on the final exam. But what if we took off and partied and didn't ever bother and we never prepared all that he gave us? We never reviewed it, didn't memorize it, didn't pay attention to it. And then we walk in the final exam and fail. I mean, would that not be completely our fault? Well, that's basically what Jesus is saying. Here's what's on the final exam. Here's what God is looking for. Everything I have told you. So woe to us if we don't pay attention to everything he said. If we're not learning it and understanding it. And and even and I would even say memorizing it. Because it's in memorizing scripture that it, it really changes how we think. I, I know this. I know. I, I said a, a challenge to our a group of guys that I was training in the ministry to memorize the Sermon on the Mount. And I realized that because obviously I'd set an example. So as I'm going through this, memorizing the Sermon on the Mount, all of a sudden, every time I'm in a discussion, scriptures would pop in my mind and I could just say them. But it, it, it became so practically useful. I mean, it was almost kind of a joke that all answers are given in the Sermon on the Mount. I, I just, it was so useful to me. It changed the way I thought, the way I think about things. So it's just to say that Jesus' words are incredibly important. You say, well, I thought he said he didn't come to judge us. Not this trip. He will come back. And we read about that in Revelation, which John will also share about us. But on this trip, he's just here to save us. That's what he's here for now. He says um, that he did not speak, but he spoke as everything God commanded him. And, and so he says, I know his commands lead to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. So all of this boils down to doing what Jesus commands and learning what he's saying, applying what he's saying, holding up Jesus as a Christian. Everything in our life needs to be centered around Jesus. He's the cornerstone. He's, 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 he's everything for us. As, as uh, St. Patrick said, Jesus in the morning, Jesus at noon, Jesus in the evening, Jesus when I rise, Jesus when I go to sleep, Jesus when I think, Jesus when I pray. It's just, it's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And the better we understand that and the more we give ourselves over to that, the more incredible God can work and work through us. And so we'll, 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 we've run out of time already and I just, at least I got to chapter 13. I thought we were going to get into chapter 13, um, but we'll do that in the next study. So thank you so much for being with us. And that's uh, plenty enough to think about today. God bless you.